Casual Diary Podcast, episode 318. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because here's what I know. I know that many of you that are listening today, you eventually want to, well, you don't want to work anymore. That's why you're listening. You're like, how can I possibly work less, retire in some place, uh, hopefully eventually, but Maybe there are other options that you've not considered. Many of you know I've spent some time overseas. I, I grew up overseas. I've, I've visited many, many countries, especially in Eastern Europe and Belize and, and many other places. But you also know that people live there. But have you ever considered being anywhere other than the country you were born in? Well, Today's guest would be considered the world's foremost authority on subjects like living, retiring, and doing business overseas, meaning outside the U.S., and she's been doing it for such a long time. It's probably easier to get a list of countries she hasn't been to than the 50 countries she has. She's invested in real estate in 23, established businesses in seven, renovated historic properties in six, and educated her children in four. That's called her passport is full and she's got a <laughs> lot of information to share with you and I. Help me welcome the publisher and founder of Live and Invest Overseas, Kathleen Pedicord. Kathleen, you there? I'm here. Hello. Thank you very much for that very very gracious welcome. I'm glad to have you because uh, I one of the things that I do consider as a benefit of how I grew up is that I actually missed everything that happened in the United States from 1979 to like 1991. So everything that everyone talks about the 80s, and I'm like, I wasn't here. (laughs) So I don't know anything about it. Um, And But I actually consider that an advantage to some degree because I did learn different things about different cultures growing up overseas. So uh, tell us, how on earth did you even start that? Uh, for me, it was it was organic and and almost accidental. On the one hand, I had an idea that I wanted to live outside the states, and I had this very old world fairy tale-ish, fairy taleish little girl idea about living in Europe. I I like castles, I like <laughs> old buildings, I like all of that romantic idea that we Americans attach to to the continent and co- a continental lifestyle. So I had that from an early age that I wanted to live in Europe, but but I had no specific agenda for how to ever make that happen. And it was really just a kind of romantic daydream. But then I went to work right out of college for a small Baltimore-based publishing company because I wanted to be a writer. And Mm -hmm. I took a job as an entry-level editor in a publishing company that it turned out had a big interest generally as as an institution in living, traveling, investing, and uh, buying real estate and running businesses in places outside the United States. So the owner of the company, who was my boss and eventually my partner for for decades, uh, which gives away my age at this point, (laughs) but I, I worked with for a very long time, he had a very big personal interest in the world beyond the United States and diversifying his business, his investment life, and his personal life. And I was able to kind of ride along on the coattails of that for for years, starting from the age of 22, just out of school. And then eventually, when I was 35, uh, leaving the States and moving to Ireland, my the first place I went full-time outside the States was Waterford, Ireland, to open an office, an EU Ireland office for this publishing company. And so I uh, opened that office, ran the business from Ireland for seven years, 
my son was born while we were living in Ireland. Hmm. Then we moved to Paris and we, was there for four years. And then about eight and a half years ago, moved to Panama City, which is where we're living now. Got it. Got it. And just so so that we have framework at this moment, you I mean, you were originally and still are, I'm assuming, an American citizen. Yes. I am. Yep. I am. And I'm a U.S. citizen. I'm also an Irish citizen. I was able to acquire an Irish passport because of our extended residency in Ireland. So my family, we're, we have also Irish passports, which I think is very nice because it's an EU passport, which means that the kids, not only my husband and me, but the kids can go to school, live or work anywhere in the EU. Well, there's an option that that that's different. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think it exactly. I think it a second passport uh, in particular, a second passport to an EU member country, I think opens a lot of doors for for anyone, but especially for a kid, you know, going to school or getting a job initially, it it means that you've got all those countries to choose from. Okay, okay. I'm getting ahead of myself and I can <laughs> see that this is going to go in many different uh, in in wonderful directions already. So uh, I've got to actually back up and ask you the same question that I tend to ask everybody when they are here for the first time. And it it, it simply has to do with how they become an entrepreneur. For, for example, I tend to look at a lot of today's entrepreneurs, of course, you are one, um, a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, you've got Black Widow, Wonder <laughs> Woman, the, the, the Hulk, what have you. And I think... Uh, entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton in common because occasionally we get dressed up. Uh, we, we at least in our minds are flying around and saving our customers, right? And right. <laughs> using our special abilities. Uh, but also like superheroes before, you know, Spider-Man was climbing walls. He was just kind of taking photos and doing the whole, you know, photojournalism newspapers. Right. Day to day life. Yeah. Right. He had a beginning. So before all the countries, uh, that you've now visited and worked in before uh, your your own before live and invest overseas before all of this. What we really want to know is who is Kathleen Petticord? <laughs> I am a small town girl. I, I mean, I grew up in Baltimore, which is a I, I don't know if you've ever seen the television series The Wire, which uh, made Baltimore kind of infamous, but it showed, you know, Baltimore is a down and gritty working class blue collar town for a while had the biggest murder rate in the country, murder by gunshot. So wow. that was the rep that's the reputation of Baltimore. That's where I grew up. Uh, and I, uh, my family still lives in Baltimore. I have lots of friends there. I wanted to be a writer. So I was a small town girl who ha I did have big ideas about wanting to travel and I wanted to be a writer. That was what I, I've had in my head since I was in the sixth grade, I think. Hmm. And so I, as I say, I took a job out of school with a Baltimore publishing company uh, because there's not a big publishing industry in Baltimore. I was engaged when I graduated college. And so I didn't want to leave Baltimore to go to say New York or somewhere where I, there would be a much you know, many bigger opportunities in publishing. So I kind of took the job I could find in publishing in Baltimore and I was an editor. So for years, I, I mean, what you're describing for Spider-Man, uh, day to day taking <laughs> photographs, it literally kind of, that was my life. I wasn't taking photographs, but I was editing copy. I was a proofreader and a copy editor. Then I was an editorial director, just working my way up the, you know, through the ranks as an editor. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, and here's what I've also learned, having talked now to a number of entrepreneurs, is that there's there's this path that we're on. It sets out, and we end up where we are through a series of circumstances, but we're always faced with a choice. That choice is what I like to call that superhero moment. There's a moment where in which you realize, hey, I've got a special ability. And then a second decision has to be made. Am I going to use it for good or evil, i.e., how on <laughs> earth am I ever going to leave the job behind and go do this thing that I feel called to do? My question to you is, how did you discover that special ability for yourself? Well, my, I, ha I did have an actual aha moment that I haven't, I haven't really ever talked about, but uh, I was working with the publishing company I went to work for out of school for 23 years. This goes back to about almost 10 years ago now. I was working for them, living in Paris, running an office for them, and decided that it was time for a big change. I didn't know what that change would be. And so a lot of things going on with that 
business with that company and, and just the way things were playing out, I thought it was time to, to take my leave from that group. And so I retired. I was uh, 45 years old, and which is very young to be retiring. But I thought, well, I, I, didn't, I didn't need to work. My husband was working and we had made investments and, and I'd been working and earning a good living and we had savings and blah, blah, blah. And we were in Paris, which was my dream since a little girl to live in Paris. I still had a very young son. My son at the time was uh, maybe six or seven years old. And so I thought, I'm, I'm going to stop working and then I'm just going to enjoy being in Paris and I'm going to be a, a mom full time, which I had, I have two children, but I had never done that. I'd always been a full time working mother. And so I did that for three months and I took my son, I walked my son to school every morning. I went marketing. I did all the errands that a housewife does. And then I took advantage of being in Paris. I went to museums. I took five and six hour walks th around the old quarter of Paris. I, I, you know, I went uh, through parks and gardens and I did all the things that you can do in Paris. And if you're going to do nothing, Paris is a really good place for it because <laughs> it's easy to do, you know, to fill days doing what amounts to nothing, but it's an amazingly rich and interesting and fun and fulfilling lifestyle. You know, but, you, uh, you know, when you're, when you're describing this part right here, I keep picturing, and I don't know if you, if you have, but for those of you who have, if you've seen the beginning of Beauty and the Beast, when Belle is just kind of singing her way through town and not really... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's what it, not doing anything. Yeah, exactly. not doing anything. But you, that's you can do like. that in Paris and be really happy. It can seem great. And so I was doing that. And three about three months into this, one afternoon at about two o'clock in the afternoon, I was sitting in a park near where my son was going to school. I didn't have to pick him up until four o'clock. So I was sitting in the park and I likely could have sat there for two hours. I would read or you know, write in a journal or, you know, the things you do sitting in a park, watch the kids play. Well, my very good friend in Paris, her name was Emma Mwella. She was the mother of a girl in my son's class, Emma. And Emma Mwella happened to walk by on the street and saw me sitting in the park. Emma Mwella was on, was working and walking from one place to another back to her office, came into the park and said, Kathy, what are you doing? And I said, I'm sitting in the park. And she said, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. What are you doing sitting in this park? How long are you going to sit here? And that was my aha moment. That was when I thought, yeah, you know what? You're right, Emanuela. This is enough. I'm not, I'm 45 years old. I'm not sitting on park benches for the next 30 or 40 years or something. What am I doing? And so she sat down and we talked and she said, you know, you need to do something. You, you need to figure <laughs> something out. And so she went on her way back to work. I walked home and walked in the door to my husband and said, I'm going to start a business. And he was working at home because he was doing a real estate development project with a partner, but working out of, the, out of our apartment. So he was, you know, looking down at his desk, looking away from me. And I walked in, opened the door and said, I'm going to start a business. And he said, okay, then we have to leave Paris. I said, okay. I closed the door to his little apartment office, went away and thought about it. 20 minutes later, came back and said, all right, let's go to Panama. He said, okay, let's go to Panama. And Panama made sense. We, it, the conversation isn't really quite as crazy as it may sound because we had been doing business in a, a number of countries already. By this time, we had business interests and investments and, and infrastructure in many different countries, including in Paris, in France. But we knew from the experience that we'd had to that point that France is no place to try to start up a business. France is not a place to be an entrepreneur. The French don't appreciate it. They don't value it. They make it really hard, really huh. expensive. Sounds bureaucracy, like California. Bureaucracy is a French <laughs> word. Exactly. And it probably, it, California may be more and more like France all the time. Labor law so heavily uh, favors the employee. The taxes are so high. The cost of operating in every way is so, so high. So whereas at the same time, we knew Panama was the opposite situation. Panama at the time and still today, because uh, it's uh, more than nine years later, but Panama is working so hard to attract foreign investors and entrepreneurs. And they offer the country offers many incentives, especially a lot of tax benefits. It's possible to find a very educated English speaking labor force here. 
to you know put in place all the infrastructure you you need for various kinds of businesses, especially an internet business, which was what I mm. knew I wanted to do. And really, all things considered, and we did go away and look at it a little more closely and have more conversations following the one that af- initial afternoon. But when you put it all down on paper and and you know really try to compare, Panama stands out as. I really think one of, if not the best place in the world right now to operate this kind of a business. That's saying a lot, but it's also coming from a person who's been through a lot of different countries. So I'm curious, though, to know when it comes down to making this decision, I'm hearing a lot of uh, financial or reasons in terms of, especially when it comes to operating a business. And I hear a lot of the cost and the bureaucracy Many of us would love to escape that in various different forms. Um, Help me understand a little bit more, like, what is Panama doing that makes it attractive for the entrepreneur to start there? Well, it's possible to operate in Panama and, and, you know, I'll, I'll speak simply and, and kind of superficially because every situation is different and anyone, I, I want to add the disclaimer, anyone interested in this idea needs to get, you know, personal uh, advice from an attorney and, and a tax advisor, obviously. But that aside, uh, you c- it's possible to operate tax-free in Panama. And there are a handful of places around the world where this is true. These are countries that tax on what's called a jurisdictional basis. So countries that tax only income earned in the country. So operating huh. in, an internet business, we don't earn any money in Panama. Our customers aren't Panamanians. Our customers are mostly North Americans, but they're English speakers around the world. We operate as a certain kind of a corporation that huh. is it's completely legal, compliant. It's not We're not doing anything that loads of other people aren't doing and loads of more people couldn't do. But you just need some advice on how to structure things properly. And if you uh, you know, form the right kind of corporation and set yourself up properly, you can, it's possible as a, as a, a foreigner running a business, an entrepreneur, foreign entrepreneur in Panama to operate tax free. And any entrepreneur will recognize that's, that's a big, big deal. That can be a big advantage. That You got my attention. Uh, that's for sure. Now, I also know, you know, from having traveled uh, a number of places, nowhere near as many as you, but one of the reasons I like traveling often is because, especially like, for example, I've spent some time in Belize. This is one of these countries where a $20 bill can feed you for three days. Uh, and, <laughs> and it's like, wow, you know, and is that a similar situation when it comes to cost of living uh, in Panama? It's a, that is the case outside Panama City and much of the country. The, it, the Panamanians refer to the to all of Panama beyond Panama City as the interior, <laughs> the interior of the country, which is the whole country other than the capital, is still super super affordable in the way you're describing. Where a couple could live here on a thousand dollars a month or twelve hundred dollars a month. Panama City is not so affordable anymore. It's 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 much more affordable. I first started spending, or sorry, much less affordable today. I started spending time here maybe 17 or 18 years ago. At Back then, this was a super cheap, you know, screaming bargain of a destination. It's gotten steadily more expensive, Panama City. Again, you know, and as is the case in the United States, you can't really speak of the cost of living of a country because what's the cost of living in the United States? It's different in Manhattan than in Des Moines, for example. Right. And so you, uh, in Panama, you've and in any country, you have to rem- I think of it as thin slicing. So thin slice the country, slice it up according to regions. And The rest of Panama is still very affordable, more expensive than it used to be, but still really affordable. Uh, But Panama City is working so hard to be a first world, seriously competitive destination. You know, Panama City is trying to be competitive with Singapore and Dubai. Wow. And and setting itself up as a a serious top-tier expat entrepreneur destination. And that comes at a cost because it, it means that a lot of money is being attracted here. And so a lot of services and infrastructure is developing to support all of that interest. But because there is a lot of competition and, and there's a, a big market, the, the a big appetite, the costs are going up. Yeah, that, that, well, that would make sense. But what I what I'm what I'm hearing is 
you know, there's a window of opportunity that you've discovered uh, and that I would assume exists in many different countries that you've probably visited over time. Well, for sure, in Panama, there is a big window of opportunity for an entrepreneur, both for, for an entrepreneur to start a business and also for an investor looking for cash flow, rental investments, for example. That the, That's a big opportunity in Panama. The, the opportunity to be an entrepreneur, to start a business, you could start a business anywhere today, as I'm sure you, you know. But, uh, all you need is an internet connection and a laptop. Is it going? It, or just an it depends, iPhone. <laughs> or exactly, exactly. But depends on, you know, but it's uh, how scalable is the opportunity depending on the destination. And so if you want to scale it up as, as I did, I knew when I started this business that I, I could have run an operation with me and maybe one or two other people, you know, producing content to sell online in some way or, or form, try to develop a following for a blog or something like that. That's, that's definitely a legitimate business model. And that can, It'd be what someone wants to do and be all that you're up for. But I wanted, I wanted to challenge myself to see how big a business I could build. For me, growth is important and my growth agenda is very ambitious. And we've, you know, I wouldn't be able to be growing the business as fast and as big as we are growing it here in Panama in many other places for one big reason in particular, and that's labor. I have about, a st- I have about 30 people in the office here in Panama city. And uh, th- as I say, they're English speaking, educated, real world, 20 and 30 somethings who have been attracted to Panama because there is so much, uh, opportunity here for, for employment. There's, there's just a, it's a big market for employment. And so my staff is mostly from Europe, frankly. I have Germans and British and Irish and French and Dutch. Okay, so now I've got to ask the question, how many languages do you speak? Oh, uh, I am, have to Im, be embarrassed to admit I speak a little French and a little Spanish, but neither of those languages nearly as well as I should after all this time. My children are both fully trilingual and speak French, Spanish, and English all fluently, and I embarrass them when I go out with them. So do the kids ever like start talking in Spanish around mom? So mom can't understand they do, in French, mostly French. They, do. they definitely will have, <laughs> because we lived in France in Paris for those four years. And my son was four when we moved to Paris, he was eight when we left. And so those are very formative years. And so he, he started school in Paris, for example. So the first language he learned to, to read and write was French. So for him, really French is, is probably his in many ways, his first language. He only speaks English with uh, with his family, with us at home. Interesting. This is awesome. See, I, and I think this particular trend, I, there's another friend in the cash flow diary community. He, he lives in Spain and, and his children, the, you know, same, it's very similar situation, very, very similar situation in terms of how, how the interaction with the children goes. But what you bring up something that I think is interesting because on one hand, I'm hearing lower expenses, and at the same time, I'm still hearing the possibility for cash flow. The dollar goes further. It seems like retirement is more of a possibility for more individuals uh, in if they're willing to consider something outside of what might be their home country or backyard. So what's a realistic amount, would you say, uh, to, for someone to make retirement possible You know, in, in a country like Panama? Really, a thousand dollars. It can be done on a thousand dollars a month. I okay, know people hold on, doing hold on, it hold on, on. Hold on, yep. hold on. <laughs> Somebody was on the treadmill. They probably choked or something when you said that. <laughs> so I just want you to repeat that one more time so that they can hear the same number. Go for it. it on a, a couple, and I'm speaking about a couple. We we do budgets for all these countries we write about, and we always address the budget from a couple's point of view because, frankly, it doesn't make that much difference to a budget. But on a thousand dollars a month. And that's true. I could, I could think of a dozen countries where you, you could live a comfortable, interesting life on a thousand dollars a month. And as you say, most everybody can come up with a thousand dollars a month for retirement. Well, yeah. And I mean, that's only a few properties. Yeah. yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. That, I mean, that's really what, what translated in my head is, you know, you, you've got, I mean, your worst case scenario is it's five single family houses, one apartment building, um, Shoot, that's one short-term rental property will produce that, uh, and you're done. That's really uh, yeah. what I just heard. That's uh, definitely true. 
that's insane and awesome all at the same time. Now, how does how complicated has it been? Because uh, I've worked with a number of overseas individuals from you know Canada, Germany, UK, um, UK, just various other places. Moving money amongst Americans is often very challenging internationally, back and forth. Has that been, I mean, you've done business in so many different places. I, I'm assuming you are well-versed with FATCA and all the, all of the Patriot Act in more ways than you pro- most people would want to be. Well, it, you're, you're right. This is, this, is really, uh, this is really a challenge right now. This is, I think, the biggest challenge for an entrepreneur, an expat entrepreneur, someone trying to start and run a business in an, an American, trying to start and run a business in another country. The post-FATCA stuff, and then the, the more recent thing is the U.S.'s crusade against money laundering, their anti-money right. laundering crusade, which again is, is challenging banks around the world to act as, um, as policemen. And, to, and all of the reporting and compliance required is making it very difficult to do even mundane, completely benign, completely innocent things with your own money around the world. Uh, difficult and and more expensive all the time because the high costs of factor compliance are are being understandably passed on to the to the clients and so banking fees for offshore banks are often very shocking to an American who's used to free checking and and all <laughs> and things like that and and in the offshore world that's that's not the case. Yeah, well, you know what? And I just realized something. You, I, I, I've done this before, and I did it again. I, I took us a place without. Some people might not know what FATCA is, so, so can you put it in simple terms? Okay, as you can tell, there are many, many different things and facets to placing your capital all across the globe, and there's going to be many more. And some of you might feel a little overwhelmed, but that's okay. Let's talk about something though. Where you start isn't necessarily where you stay. Why am I saying that? It's because many of you want to start in your home country, and that's completely fine. But there's also opportunity all across the globe. Those are the things that are important to understand today is that you and I, we all have the ability to go across the globe to be able to find opportunity. It doesn't mean we're restricted to our own borders. So you're probably figuring that out. But you're also figuring out there are new things that you've got to learn to. And that's okay. Speaking of some new things, picking up new skills, why don't you grab a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. Go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. And uh, fix yourself right on up. Just name an email and we'll send it straight on over to you. Let's get back to Kathleen. FATCA is, uh, shoot, I can't think of what it stands for, but it's... It's a uh, it's a consequence of the the Patriot Act or so, sorry no it's a comp oh you you put me on the spot it is it's a symptom a little piece of what was called the Higher Act the sorry that was it the Higher Act which was a very misnamed uh, piece of legislation that ostensibly was about creating jobs but it had this piece in it and this is how these these pieces of legislation gets pa- get passed. Something like FATCA gets passed because it's a tiny piece of a thousand page piece of, of legislation. And, but what FATCA has required is for any bank that wants around the world that wants to continue doing business with U S banks to report any accounts and ac- account activity of any American clients to the IRS. And so it's it's the most it's the most extraterritorial piece of legislation in U.S. history. I think in global history, it's 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 just maddening. It's, it leaves me speechless when I think about what the U.S. did, what the IRS has managed to do here. And the most ridiculous part of it is that the rest of the world has now. I think FATCA has been in place for uh, it's several years, maybe five years. Five years later. World banks are complying because they have no choice. Because what is a bank going to do in Panama or Andorra or Uruguay or wherever? Their choice is to not work with U.S. banks. But most all transactions at least go through a U.S. correspondent bank. So even if you're not directly talking about a transaction that comes to or from a U.S. bank, it's likely passing through a U.S. correspondent bank coming or going wherever it's going. And so a bank in Uruguay, what are they going to do? Be shut out of the U.S. banking system? Or are they going to say, okay, 
U.S. government, we'll do what you want us to do. We'll inst- we'll institute, put in place, invest in all of this infrastructure for reporting compliance. That it's take banks have been five years dealing with it, and and they're still not completely compliant because just of the enormity of the whole thing, the enormity of investment of time and cost. And so now Americans. They have to take for granted that whatever bank account you have in another country is automatically, is naturally and necessarily going to be, uh, the IRS is going to be notified of it by the foreign bank, which shouldn't actually be a problem for an American because an American with a foreign bank account is meant to report that fact to the IRS himself on his FBAR, now called the FinCEN form, the F-I-N-C-E-N form, which you need, if you have a foreign bank account, you're meant to file every year. Right. And this uh, continuing reporting requirement, um, let's just translate that into it costs more money, guys. (laughs) Exactly. It costs more money. Yeah. (laughs) And it's a big hassle. It's a big hassle. You all kinds of now documentation is required for even the simplest thing. Even we, you know, we deal with a lot of banks in a lot of countries on on a daily basis just in in the normal course of our business, just paying sure. writers or paying right. vendors or whatever. No, totally natural, normal things for a, a small business owner to do. But the requirement for documentation from the bank can be really big. It can, it, it will drive you crazy. We, we, our staff spends, our accounting staff spends, spends a fair amount of time just responding to banks requests for documentation. What is this money? Where did it come from? Why are you sending it here? What's it being used for? Absolutely. And, and I guess with a business that is definitely based online, uh, one of the things I like about technology is that, you know, your workforce expands because you can access so much talent from so many different places. But yet little things that like this <laughs> can get in the way to make doing business in multiple countries uh, a, a challenge. Has there been anything else that you found either specifically, say, in owning real estate uh, in foreign countries that's been uh, uniquely problematic? I think that the uh, that it is uh, more challenging for sure to run a, to manage a rental property in another country if you're not living in that country. So we have okay. uh, some rentals in Panama, in Panama City, and that's not that big a deal. We're here if there's a problem with the tenant, if there's a repair required, or you know the normal things that come up with a rental property, we can go over or we can send some one of our staff over to deal with it immediately and. And efficiently, you know, from the scene in real time. But we have rentals as well in a half dozen other countries right now. And, you know, if something happens to our rental in, in uh, uh, Medellin, Colombia, or in uh, uh, Portugal, we have a rental on the Algarve in Portugal, for example. If something happens there, well, we can't get on a plane and fly to Portugal overnight to, <laughs> to go meet with the plumber to talk about how to repair the leak in the bathroom. So what, so the, you have to have really good staff in place. I think that success with a uh, long distance rental, as I think of them, a rental in another country where you're not living or spending time comes down to your rental manager, your rental and property manager and getting a good one who you trust and who will stay in constant communication with you. Communication is really the key. Someone who'll stay in constant communication with you, that is critical because without that, so we had a rental, we don't have this anymore, but years ago in Buenos Aires, Argentina, and we never got reporting. We never got any communication from the rental manager there. So after I think four months or so had passed, we were asking, asking for reporting and and, uh, getting nothing. Finally, my husband got very serious and said, okay, you know, you, you must provide a report. Okay. The woman man- manager finally sent a report that showed that the, the apartment had been empty for six weeks. And it, when the last tenant moved out six weeks prior, it, it hadn't been re-rented at all. It was a short-term rental. So we were turning over rent- renters every week or two weeks or something. But no one had been in there for six weeks. Well, when we asked her what happened, what, you know, why suddenly this big gap in occupancy, she said, well, I can't rent it with the flood in the bathroom. 
And we said, well, <laughs> we said, okay, but why didn't you say something about the flood in the bathroom oh, and we would have repaired it and then you could have rented it again. Right. And so that kind of, that's <laughs> obviously not what you don't, that's what you don't want to happen. No. And so it comes down to just a rental manager who, you know, who stays in touch with you on a, you know, real time basis. Now you mentioned a number of countries in that last little section, which says to me that there's you you have I'm assuming they weren't done randomly. You didn't just throw a dart and say, "Hey, how about here?" <laughs> you know, so <laughs> no. there there's a method there to the madness, I'm sure. How does one choose where? Cuz once you cuz what you've just done in this in in and I think many people are catching on is you real estate is the entire world. <laughs> we just went exactly. from my backyard to anywhere. Now exactly. the question of where becomes really, really huge and that much more complicated. How on earth did you choose? Well, w- there are a lot of answers to that question. But for me, the most important one is, well, let me back up. Is it, I think I guess it has to be a two-part answer. One, obviously, you're choosing a market with with a proven rental track record a market with an active rental uh, demand of, of a particular kind. It can be a short-term tourist demand. It can be a long-term expanding middle-class demand. It can be commercial demand. It, you know, there's some proven demand that, you are, that you've identified and that you believe is going to continue and that you can tap into. That has to be the starting point. But then the, the, as, as important for me, the other answer to the question how we've chosen the places where we have invested in rental properties is they're all places where we like to spend time personally. Mm. They're all places where we want an excuse to travel <laughs> as often as possible. And I really, I think that's really important because then your rental manager saying, well, I, of course I can't pl- rent the place because the bathroom's flooded. You've got to fix the f- leak and then renovate the bathroom and then I can rent it again for you. If, if that apartment is in a place you don't enjoy being, that you just think, oh my gosh, I have to go back there again, ugh. Well, what fun is that? Because eventually you need to go. This isn't, I mean, like real estate anywhere. It's not like a stock. It requires some management. And eventually it's going to require some on the ground management. Even if you have a, an excellent rental manager, eventually you're going to need to go. So why not want to go? Why not invest in rental properties that have uh, real and and uh, substantial investment return potential, yield potential, but that are also places where you think when you're at your desk at home or doing what you do otherwise day to day, boy, I can't wait until the next time I have to go back to check on that apartment. Or, <laughs> boy, I think I, I think I really need to go check on that apartment. Let me see what works right. in my schedule. And then the travel, as, a, as an aside, the travel to and from these properties when you're going to check on a rental investment is tax deductible. So, so the trip to go to a place that you want to go to anyway to check on a, uh, an asset that's producing a return for you can be tax deductible. But really, for me, I think the personal, you can't underestimate, and I really strongly recommend against ignoring or downplaying the personal part of this. Go to, Choose places where you and your partner, your spouse, your children, your best friend, where you're going to enjoy going year after year. Yeah, I, I totally agree. People ask me all the time, uh, you know, there are s- certain places specifically in the U S they're like, Jay, what about, uh, what about Michigan? And I'm like, no, they're like, right. why? I'm like, it snows, but, exactly. but, but this deal, it's half off. I don't care. <laughs> it exactly. Snows. It, I it's never the same idea. There. And I love it, you know, cause you know, it it never hurts to have a nice fruity drink while you're waiting on the painter to finish their work. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, that I think that's the idea. And and the most successful investments that my husband and I have made have have definitely fallen into this category. And so my husband is definitely the investor. He's the numbers guy. He puts everything into a spreadsheet, boils it down, figures the percentages, the yields, the occupancy rates, the, all of that. And I understand, obviously that's really important. And, but I, I, I value that of course, and I pay attention to that, but then I'm the one who comes behind and says, but 
that's not a place that we're, the kids are, the kids are never going to come there. They're, if we're going to be spending time there, the kids are never going to come with us. So let, couldn't we think of this place instead? Because there are so many choices, as you say. Right. If you find a place where even where you can put down on paper, oh, this will bring us a great investment return. Well, okay, but there are at any given point in t- any day of the year, any time, you can identify a dozen or several dozen places that could bring you a good return or a great return. So among them, choose the ones that just appeal to you and your family personally. Got it. So now I'm going to put you on the spot. Top three places in the world, according to Kathleen Petticord. For investing or living, retiring? Yes. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Fair enough. I, I would put uh, Medellin, Colombia at the top. Okay. For investment and for lifestyle, Medellin is a beautiful, charming, pretty safe city with great weather, great people, and super low cost. The U.S. dollar is really strong against the Colombian peso right now, stronger than it's been in decades. Okay. So the dollar goes really strong. This is a place where you could feed yourself on a week on a $20 bill. Medellin is, and Colombia are much cheaper than Belize, for example, what? at the current exchange rate. Much cheaper. That's not and so, possible. It's amazingly cheap. And Medellin is a real city. This is a, a really int- interesting thing that that I think uh, not people, many people realize. Uh, Medellin is like a European city. It's a very Euro chic city. It has everything you think of in a real city, five-star restaurants, shopping malls, whereas Belize is, I love Belize. I'm, I'm not dissing on Belize. I love Belize. I have lots of friends there. I've been spending time there for 30 years, and we have many investments in Belize. But Belize, I love for its simplicity, its rustic charm, its right. back-to-basic living, and it's the best of nature and all of that. But Medellin, Colombia is a real city. It's, it's an, uh, an, an artist city. It's the publishing hub of uh, Colombia. It's the hometown of the artist, the sculptor Botero. There's a big Botero museum and an open-air sculpture garden. Lots of parks and gardens. Things you don't think of normally with, a, 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 you know, you wouldn't think of with Colombia. Oh, my gosh, that's really, they, they have such a place there. You have to go see it to appreciate how nice Medellin is and also to appreciate how cheap it is right now, both for living and for investing. And so if you wanted to, if you want to name a place that checks all the boxes, great place to live, great place to retire, great place to invest, Medellin, I think, should be at the top. Wow. Number two, I would say Algarve, Portugal, which is a, w- one of our most recent investments was in an apartment on the coast of Algarve, Portugal, uh, which we made uh, about a year ago. And uh, this is a uh, part of Europe that is undiscovered, I think kind of neglected and ignored. Americans, we think of France and Italy, Spain, maybe Ireland as Europe. We don't really think that much or I think, frankly, know that much about Portugal. Portugal is very rich in history. Plus, it has a long, long coastline and the sunniest, best weather in Europe. So it has sunny weather year round. It doesn't get as the same kind of winter that France, for example, gets. It has uh, beautiful beaches, some of Europe's and in fact, some of the world's best beaches and very active rental markets in these, these beach towns for tourists. And so we bought these, some of these beach towns though, aren't what you think of as typical beach towns. They're, they're old world cities. So there's one called Lagos, for example, L-A-G-O-S, that is on the Southern coast of of Algarve, that is, it dates back to the Middle Ages. It's been a, a, hmm. a city on that coast since the Middle Ages, and it's today a, a, a charming, lovely old world city that is a with an active operating harbor. And just outside town are beautiful beaches all up and down the coast, north and south. And it it's attracting tourists from all over Europe and increasingly a bit from North America, but especially from Europe. So very active tourist trade. We bought this rental apartment right in the center, just a block off the main square of Lagos for about a year ago for a hundred thousand euros. My husband will correct me. It was 98,000 euros. Yeah. He's always <laughs> correcting my numbers. It was, I would say about a hundred thousand euros, which right now is not a lot more in us dollars. And it took us, I think, I don't know, two to three months to do some minor renovation work to get it ready to rent and to get it listed with a rental manager. And it's been 
and we've put it up for short-term rental, it's been better than 90% occupied since it's been on the market for about eight months. Nice. I love this. I love this. Does anyone ever tell you, though, that when you're talking, it sounds like a vacation, they just close their eyes? <laughs> <laughs> so what's number uh, three? What's number, number three? Number three is harder because I, I'll give you two choices for number three. Okay. One would be... Uh, Panama, just outside Panama City, on the pa- in the Panama Beaches area, it's called the Panama City Beaches area, just out pa- outside Panama City. This isn't going to be as super cheap as uh, Medellin or Lagos is right now, or the Algarve, Car- Algarve Coast of Portugal, but very active rental markets, thriving and booming and growing rental markets, and still possible to buy a condo on in this beaches area for say two hundred thousand dollars, two hundred to maybe two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So not super expensive, and the returns are solid. And I think that there's a lot of appreciation upside in the asset in the properties, and definitely very very solid return to be had from. Uh, from rental and financing is a possibility in Panama for the foreign mm-hmm. buyer. Wow. So that would be a great choice. The other choice I might put out there alongside that as a number three would be Las Terrenas in the Dominican Republic. And this is a Caribbean island town, beach town that with a, with a big French population, it's a f- very funny thing about 30 years ago, a few French people came to Las Terrenas, loved it. I mean, this sounds like a a silly thing, but this is really what happened here. Just came to it for a vacation in the Caribbean, loved it, decided to stay, sent back word to all their friends and family back in France about how amazing and cheap and beautiful this place was. And in the 30 years since, loads and loads of French have come. It's just organically evolved (laughs) into a big French expat community. Hmm. And so this beach town is everything you think of as a Caribbean beach town, white sand beaches, the little cute little brightly painted colorful uh, clapboard houses right along the water that are that are bars and restaurants and and all of that. So it has everything you think of in a Caribbean beach town. And it's very cheap, just like you hope a Caribbean beach town is. But it has also this French flavor. So uh, uh, figuratively speaking, this French culture uh, that's become a big part of this this region of of Dominican Republic now. Uh, So there are bakeries and, uh, you know, really, really good restaurants serving good French wine. And uh, people hear French spoken on the streets a lot. People kiss each other on both cheeks and greeting. So it has this real French flavor to it that I think makes it more interesting than, you know, just your typical old run of the mill Caribbean beach town. And uh, again, this is a market with a growing, a very active and I think growing uh, rental pool and rental potential. And so another really good cash flowing yield option. Got it, man. How do you focus when, when you look out your window, you see a postcard every day. I don't even get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Around my office I have on the walls, photographs, framed photographs, and some uh, little paintings of a lot of the places that I really like to spend time, including places that we're talking about places where we have spent time. And so I, uh, on day, you know, because Back to, you know, meanwhile, back in the office, I am just running a business. And anybody who's doing that, all of your listeners who run businesses know that day to day, it's just, it's a lot of work. This is all great and fun and exciting. And it is, and there is that element to it for sure. But it's a lot of work. And I spend a lot of hours like everybody else with a business at a laptop, you know, (laughs) just working. But in my office, I have these uh, photos and little paintings. So when I, when that, when you, you just can't stare at your laptop screen anymore, I, you know, can sit back and look across and I see, for example, a photograph, we're talking about Belize and in Cayo Belize, there is a little, uh, cafe restaurant called Evie's in the center of San Ignacio, the biggest town in Cayo that's been there forever. My, I went there on my first trip to Belize about 30 years ago. It went out of business for a few years, but recently came back and a, a friend in Belize, when it was reopened, took a photograph and sent me this photograph of the front of Evie's of their hand painted sign. So I have that on my wall, for example. For daydreaming just in case just in it's, case yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome absolutely love it now the, when it comes to um live and invest overseas a, as a business that basically would it be fair to say that what you just 
talked us through is what you guys write about on a consistent basis? Exactly. Everything we're talking about, this is what we write about. This is the kind of information that and ideas that we publish. And the, the core thing that we do is, is, is a big part of what I do every day. We publish a free daily e-letter. We have about 400,000 readers now, so it's grown very wow. nicely. And, uh, and this comes from me. So wherever I am in the world, we travel a lot, my husband and I, and uh, wherever I am, I, I put this together. And so it can be from the scene. I mean, it can be what you were just talking about. I'm looking out my window, and this is what I see. And we had dinner with so-and-so last night, our banker friend, and he told us this. And we're meeting with, our real est- with a real estate agent friend later. He's going to show us this, blah, 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 that kind of thing. That uh, comes out every day, and as I say, it's free, and uh, that's a really good first step. If you're you know, just beginning to think about these ideas and options, then sign up for that and just read for a few weeks or a few months and, and see if any of this makes sense to you. Excellent. Love it. Now, for those that actually do want to take you up on that, how, how do they track it down and, and get started? If you, we have a website, liveandinvestoverseas.com. It's all one word. And if you go there on the homepage, in the upper right-hand corner is a little box uh, to enter your email address to be added to the list for the free e-letter. Got it, got it. Now, as we wind down, I've got one question for you that I'm curious to hear your answer to um, because I'm assuming it's going to involve something with a passport simply because uh, that's your life. <laughs> and I love it, I love it. So... Let's, for a moment, I, I believe that there's someone listening who, who, as they say, would be standing in front of that superhero outfit store. They, they think they're wanting to become that entrepreneur. They are ready. They have an idea about how to, to make their business happen. They want to build their cash flow and keep it going. However, they also have that voice. You know, that voice that comes up every time we think about stepping into our greatness and becoming more than what we currently are, or in your case, traveling to a complete different country. That voice that often right. comes up and says something that's opposite. And for some people, they're actually related to that voice. My question to you, Kathleen, is if they were actually going to do what you asked them to do, to take their next steps what would you tell them? I would tell them to start reading about it, thinking about it, and to make a list of, of priorities, personal priorities for investment and for lifestyle. And then in your reading and your thinking, identify places that, that connect to the points on your priority list. What's most important to you? Sunny, sunshine and great weather. Uh, high speed internet because you, you couldn't live with, you know, you couldn't live without a, a fast connection 24 seven, whatever's most important to you. What kind of, and ask yourself these questions. What view would you like to see out your bedroom window every morning? What would you like to do on a Sunday afternoon? What's your favorite way to spend a Friday night? You, you know, think through your personal preferences, priorities, make a list, then consider places that offer those things connect the dots, make a short list of two or three places that meet your criteria for the kind of lifestyle you like, for your personal preferences, the kind of investor agenda you have, depending on your portfolio, your budget, your tolerance for risk, et cetera. And then, as as you said, it is going to involve a passport. You need to get on a plane and go see because uh, no amount of reading online, even Mm -hmm. our stuff, no amount of research is going to really substitute for showing up and walking around. You know, the, the boots on the ground element here can't be dismissed. And when you do that, when you show up and you, so you make a list and you think I like cities and, uh, I, I like developed infrastructure Mm -hmm. and, uh, I want a, I want a good tourist market to tap into for a rental investment. Okay. So we just talked about three places that could make sense. Panama City, Medellin, Colombia, uh, Lagos, Portugal. They're all great cities for living, for retiring, and all offer great investment opportunities right now. So you go to each of them. Not that you have to go back to back three trips, just pick one. Make it low key, <laughs> easy, one step at a time. Okay, you think Panama's closest, easiest, and it is. You don't, it, they speak a lot of English in Panama City, so the language hurdle is easy. You can get a great off deal on airfares, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to start. I'm just going to take a trip to Panama City. Take a two-week vacation, 10 days, whatever you can manage, to Panama City. 
when you get here, do all of your research, your due diligence, ask lots of questions, talk to everybody. You know, not just real estate agents and people in the industry, but talk to waiters and taxi drivers and everybody you meet to get a feel for the place. And then at the end of your visit, allow yourself to put aside all the data you've collected, all the conversations and research, and just ask yourself, did I like being there? Did I like it there? And if your answer is no, actually, not so much. I'm happy enough to be going home. Fair enough. Then worst case, you had a vacation to Panama City. Even if you decide it's not a place you want to be long term, I'm sure you can come and have a great time here. Loads of fun things to do at the beach and et cetera in Panama. So you had a vacation. You go home. Okay, that wasn't for me. I would say don't give up. I would say then go to number two on your list. As your schedule, as your life allows, plan another trip. And you think, okay, what I found from Panama City is I don't really like the developing world. I think I'm more a first world person. Go to Lagos, Portugal. That's just, that's completely first world. You go there, you show up, do the same thing. Look around. Allow yourself to enjoy the place. Take advantage of all the fun things there are to do. Talk to people, do your research, and then at the end of that visit, think, you know what? This is more me. This is more my style. I feel very at home here. I love the food. I love the culture. I love the people. Yes, this makes sense. Then then you can take it to a next level. But I really do recommend as you're starting out that you let the, you take this in steps and let it kind of develop organically over time. Love it. 100%. I, I love the part where it doesn't and in, where it involves more than just reading yet another book, because that's my favorite right there. Excellent. I definitely appreciate, though, you taking the time to invest your <laughs> wisdom and knowledge and experience here with us uh, today at the Cashflow Diary. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? Well, I think you know what it means. It means you probably should go find your passport, dust it off, and <laughs> let's go put it <laughs> to use. But definitely get over to Live and Invest Overseas. Get some information. Begin to figure out. Let your mind begin to picture that postcard and go. Because real estate is everywhere. Opportunity is out there. And the world is waiting. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. 